Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you all see my slides and hear me? Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about a recently published work in my group, which uses biophysical modeling to investigate how the mitotic spindle forms two poles, preferentially, preferably. Um, so, okay. Um, to start the discussion, I would like to first briefly remind you that the mitotic spindle uh, is the prominent cell apparatus that forms uh, during cell division. So as you can see here in this cartoon, um, and the spindle is a bipolar structure, and each pole eventually connects to one side of the duplicated DNA chromosome. And towards the end of the cell division, the spindle structure will pull sister chromatids apart from each other and they will finally end up in two daughter cells. So that being said, uh, this proper formation of a bipolar uh, mitotic spindle is crucial for correct cell division. Um, and the spindle assembly is actually a, a highly dynamic and complex process. Uh, it requires the joint efforts of a multitude of molecules and cellular components, including uh, microtubules, motor proteins, linker proteins, chromosomes, centrosomes, and other regulatory uh, components. And in the past, there have been a, a lot of experimental and modeling studies addressing the functional roles of each of these components. Uh, but today, I'm gonna focus on just the centrosomes. Okay, so these uh, yellow blobs um, that forms the poles of this uh, bipolar mitotic spindle. So the centrosomes are actually just the major microtubule organizing centers in the mitotic cells. There are other microtubule organizing centers, but in during mitosis, there are major ones, and they mediate the formation of the two spindle poles. So uh, that being said, when the centrosomes are perturbed, a different number of spindle poles may form. So for example, when uh, centrosome duplication or separation went wrong in the previous cell cycle, the cell can get multiple centrosomes. And in this case, uh, uh, the cell may form a multipolar spindle. And such an aberrant spindle can mess up the mitosis and kill the cell uh, because uh, you know the daughter cells cannot get the correct number of chromosomes in this case. So on the other hand, uh, under certain perturbations, such as uh, application of the X5 inhibitor. So X5 is a molecular motor that mediates the anti-parallel sliding of microtubules and separation of the centrosomes. And when uh, X5 inhibitor is applied to the cell, the centrosomes may collapse into one pole, and then the cell can form a monopolar spindle. And mitosis is also messed up in this case. However, the cell have very robust mechanism to rescue itself from these aberrancies. In the case of the extra centrosomes, uh, given enough time, the centrosomes can often cluster into two poles and allow the cell to divide bipolarly. This process has received a lot of uh, attention in the field because it's implicated in chromosome instability and cancer development. Meanwhile, for a monopolar spindle, caused by X5 inhibitor, for example. After the drug is washed out, the spindle can also spring back to bipolarity. So that comes our key question here. How does the cell manage to separate or cluster the centrosomes depending on what it needs and form a bipolar spindle under different centrosome perturbations? And notice that both rescues must rely on the same set of molecules and cellular components that mediate normal spindle assemblies. So we really want to understand all these processes under the same mechanistic framework using the same model. So to answer this key question, we choose to build a simplified biophysical model, which focuses just on the dynamics of the centrosomes and the overall mechanical forces that drive the motion of these centrosomes in the cell. Particularly, we lump all the forces into two types. Uh, one type is the forces between pairs of centrosomes, and the other is the force between a centrosome and the other components in a cell. And we use effective potential energies to characterize these forces. So for the intercentrosomal forces, we assume that the potential energy is a function of the distance between uh, the two centrosomes, 
And we assume the energy profile looks like a flipped ball. So uh, the two centrosomes are attracting each other at short distances and repelling each other at long distances. Um, and if you think about it, uh, you know, this actually has to be the case, uh, qualitatively speaking, because if the energy profile is the other way around, um, uh, within energy minimized at some intermediate distance, then according to energy minimum principle, all the central zones will tend to stay with that intermediate distance away from each other. This would actually create a loose cloud of central zones rather than two poles. And so uh, the uh, profile we propose is kind of generally true. Um, and for the uh, inter interaction between the centrosome and the other components, we assume that they can be represented by a radial energy profile that depends on the radial position of the centrosome in the cell. Particularly, this energy is minimized at this hypothetical radial equilibrium surface, this blue dashed line. Uh, really, you know, what this energy profile does is to recapitulate the fact that the centrosomes are typically located beneath the cell cortex, of course, because of heart boundary, uh, but also outside the chromosome mass, uh, likely due to uh, steric repulsions and, and other forces. Uh, so, um, uh, so basically, we have uh, constructed these two simplified energy profile to phenomenologically capture the overall effect of the mechanical forces on a centrosome. Uh, in addition, we also introduce dynamic fluctuations in the intercentrosomal forces. Uh, in other words, the distance between the two centrosomes um, only determines an average force uh, between them. But over time, this force is going to fluctuate randomly, uh, even if the distance of the two centros centrosomes could be kept fixed in, in some magic way. Uh, so overall, this uh, randomly fluctuating force would follow a probability distribution that uh, centers around the distance dependent uh, average force. And we use a Langevin equation to uh, you know, simulate uh, the fluctuation. And I'll show you later why this for uh, force fluctuation is necessary. Um, and uh, I will also want to uh, draw your attention that uh, uh, this force fluctuation actually reflect some of the well-known dynamics in the microtubules, including microtubule instability, you know, the growing and shrinking dynamics, and also the binding, unbinding of motors and linker proteins uh, to the microtubules. So overall, we have uh, just, you know, a few simple assumptions about how the centrosomes interact with each other, um, you know, the intercentrosomal force and the uh, radial force, and also this force fluctuation. Um, so, uh, and I'll show you momentarily how these very simple assumptions are sufficient to generate predictions that can explain uh, many experimental phenomena and also make uh, interesting predictions. Um, because the model does not resolve the detailed dynamics of microtubules, motors, and you know, you know, other molecules, it's very efficient to simulate. It allows us to do multiple uh, repeats to obtain statistics for the stochastic aspects, as well as a thorough exploration of the parameter space. So let's now look at some of the most exciting results. Uh, here is a video showing uh, a typical model simulation. This is a simulation with four centrosomes in the cell. You can see at first, uh, the four centrosomes are scattered, but as time goes, they will start uh, getting together and cluster into two poles. Now, yeah, uh, they're clustered into uh, two poles in a stable fashion. Okay, so, um, so we run a lot of these uh, simulations with different parameter sets. And um, uh, let's look at uh, what's the effect of uh, uh, various model parameters. Let's first explore what's important for forming a bipolar. Uh, uh, so uh, so how, how the spindle recovers two poles uh, from a monopolar state. So to do so, we simulate the cells with two centrosomes initially clustered and then run the simulation for two hours. And eventually we can observe three possible uh, scenarios. We could either have a nice uh, stable bipolar spindle with the two centrosomes fully separated from each other, or we can have the two centrosomes just stick together throughout the simulation 
And so the monopolar spindle just persists, or we can have an unstable uh, situation where uh, the spindle just goes back and forth between monopolarity and bipolarity. And we use such a, a triangular uh, color scheme uh, to visualize the probability of each case uh, with a certain parameter set. So green would indicate uh, high uh, rates of uh, uh, stable bipolar formation and uh, red, a uh, high rate of monopolar uh, spindle and blue, a uh, high rate of unstable. Okay, so just keep that in mind. That's our uh, how we visualize it. And uh, let's first look at the effect of attractive intercentral thermal force versus repulsive intercentral thermal force. So we can see that uh, if we have uh, a strong uh, repulsion, then we tend to get a bipolar spindle and a strong uh, traction, we tend to get a monopolar spindle. And if both forces are small, then we tend to get an unstable spindle. This result itself is actually not surprising at all, right? Um, strong repulsion, then the uh, you know, centrosomes separate, strong uh, attraction, uh, centrosomes stick together. If there's just very little force between them, then it's unstable. So not surprising at all. However, it does uh, allow us uh, you know, to find a limit in the parameter choice. Particularly, we choose default force level that gives a rate of bipolarity uh, that matches uh, the typical observation, uh, which is indicated by this dash box. And in this case, you notice that the repulsion is slightly stronger than uh, the attraction. So this energy well is slightly deeper than that energy well. Um, so keep this in mind because later we'll use this uh, uh, result to explain some of the uh, some of the predictions in the model. Now let's explore the effect of the force fluctuation. So first we found that. To get bipolarity, the force fluctuation uh, level, uh, which is on the y-axis, wants to be balanced with the average intercentrosomal force, uh, which is on the x-axis. So uh, when they're proportional to each other, you get a high rates of bipolarity, this green region. Uh, if the fluctuation is too strong, then the spindle tends to be unstable. Uh, if the fluctuation is too little, then uh, the two centrosomes cannot uh, e uh, efficiently separate from each other and the spindle uh, stays monopolar. And that's exactly why I said these force fluctuations are essential. They are essential for separating the centrosomes in a, a physiologically relevant timescale. Furthermore, we found that an optimal timescale exists for the force fluctuation. So in our model, the sweet spot appears uh, around tens to the hundreds of seconds and this is very interesting because this time scale happens to be um, uh, consistent with the time scale for microtubule instability and you know this motor on and off, which are what I mentioned before, uh, the main uh, resources of the uh, force fluctuation. So the result essentially suggests uh, an important role of microtubule dynamics in the uh, bipolar spinal formation. So we need this microtubule dynamics to generate the force fluctuation which in turn is necessary for rescuing uh, the spindle from monopolarity. Next, we explore what controls the rescue of the multipolar spindles. And this time we simulate the model with four centrosomes, uh, which are originally scattered in the cell. And we again ran two hour simulations. Uh, and in this case, we can also find three possible scenarios. Uh, here, we only care about the spindle states at the end of two hours. Uh, so we can get either bipolar, monopolar, or multipolar. And we're again using this uh, triangular color scheme to visualize the probability of uh, each type uh, for a certain parameter set. And first, uh, we also look at uh, the attractive intercentral somal force uh, versus the repulsive intercentral somal force. And we find that a balance between the two forces are necessary uh, to generate uh, you know, a high probability of bipolar uh, spindle. Uh, if there's too much uh, attraction, then uh, the, uh, the centrosomes tend to stay together and we get a, mo a monopolar spindle. If there is too much repulsion, then the centrosomes cannot uh, cluster and uh, we get a multipolar spindle. But there's a pretty wide region in between that can give a good rate of bipolarity. Um, next, 
uh, here comes some very interesting and uh, kind of unexpected results. So we vary the shape of the cell while, while fixing its volume. And we felt that um, uh, compared to the round cells, the flat cells are much worse at forming bipolar spindles. This green region uh, in, uh, in the lower case is much narrower, um, much smaller uh, than the green region for uh, uh, you know, the round cells. So uh, we know that cells typically round up in mitosis. So these model results suggest one reason for why it has to do so, uh, because you know, running up the uh, cells can potentially uh, you know, increase the rates of uh, bipolar spinal formation. So um, uh, however, we notice that uh, the rounding does not have to be perfect. So if I go back a little bit, if you just compare, this is the default case with a slightly flat geometry. If you compare this one with the perfectly round one, okay, I'm just gonna jump back and forth a few times. You see, uh, yeah, the perfectly round one has a higher rate of bipolarity, but there's overall not a huge difference uh, in, in the result. Um, so uh, this result is also reminiscent of the experimental observation that uh, physically squashing a cell, making it flat, makes the spinal pole split and causes multipolar division, even in cells with just two centrosomes. Um, so next, uh, we found that a slight flatness may help the spinal orient itself. So here we examine the angle of theta of the centrosome from the equatorial plane of the cell. And you can see that, um, uh, oh, by the way, this equatorial plane uh, is, the, is the big circle in the, in the cell. So the, this uh, uh, oval shaped cell is oriented, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, is sitting kind of flat uh, on, on the ground. So this equatorial plane is the big circle. So we can see that's in a perfectly round cell, in this case, uh, the distribution of the angle theta matches what you would expect for a homogeneous random distribution around uh, the spherical surface. Uh, notice that this uh, homogeneous random distribution is not a uniform one uh, because uh, the for the same delta theta, the polar region takes up less area than the equatorial region. So there's fewer chance to find an angle that's uh, close to pi over two than close to zero. So, uh, uh, but uh, the uh, the simulation results does match the homogeneous uh, the uh, homogeneous random distribution, uh, which is as as expected as a sanity check. But then, if we look at what happens to flatter cells, okay, um, so both in the default geometry, the slightly flat one, and the very flat one, we can see that uh, the distribution of angle theta is strongly concentrated around uh, angle zero. So this indicates that the spindle uh, tend to, uh, you know, locate on the equator of the cell, which is parallel to the ground, uh, or, you know, parallel to uh, the big circle uh, of the cell. Um, so, uh, com so combined with the previous slide, so uh, we we learned that the typical geometry with a slight flatness seems to kill two birds with one stone. It both ensures bipolarity and guide the orientation of the spindle. So here I want to just briefly mention that, of course, there are all kinds of other uh, environmental cues, uh, like, uh, you know, um, uh, you know uh, forming of, uh, of uh, uh, focal cohesions with the a, with a, uh, substrates, you know, all that kind of stuff. And also, you know, the surrounding cells and surrounding environments that can give orientation cues to the spindle. But here, I'm just talking about a very basic one uh, that seems to, you know, the, that where the shape of the cell itself uh, can give some cues already. Um, so previously, uh, we changed the cell geometry while fixing its volume. And now we're going to examine the combined effects of the cell geometry and cell volume. Um, so we found that the smaller cells uh, uh, want to be flatter, and uh, large cells want to be rounder to optimize the chance of spindle polarity. Uh, oh, I forgot to say, the aspect ratio here uh, uh, is the aspect ratio of the geometry, and the larger value correspond to flat cells, and the smaller value correspond to round cells. So, um, Jing, Jing, just wanted to tell you for about about five minutes, just just to let you know. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, thank you. So <laughs> interestingly, our prediction is validated uh, by experimental data uh, from uh, uh, our experimental collaborators group. So they have uh, tetrapoid DLD1 cell clones, and they have different clones with different characteristic sizes. And uh, so you can see these large clones with a larger size and small clones with small size. Um, and notice that these clones are actually generated from the same parental cell line. So they have genetically uh, a very close genetic background. So we can assume that their spinal assembly process are very similar to each other and can base on the, uh, you know, the same parameter sets, essentially. Interestingly, the clones of larger cells, like these L clones, they're flatter than the S clones. If you look at the cell aspect ratio, these are larger, these are smaller. And so the relative, if we combine this data, the relative cell volume and aspect ratio of these tetraploid cells correspond roughly to uh, you know, this region uh, on our model prediction. And if we have a zoom in view, we can, uh, we can see that uh, you know, the L and S circle uh, really correspond to the observed range for the L, S and close uh, respectively. And the model would predict a higher rate of uh, bipolarity in the S clones. Indeed, that's what's observed in the experiment. So the S clones, uh, the S clones, uh, you know, uh, the cells with extra centrosomes in S clones were observed to form bipolar spinels more likely than those in the L clones. So the model prediction is validated by the experiment. And actually, all the results I just showed you, uh, you know, about the cell geometry and about the cell volume, comes from a similar reason. So now I'm going to explain why the model. Uh, you know, generates these predictions. And hopefully that gives us some insights into, you know, what happens in the cell. So um, I'm going to take the cell rounding as an example here. And the argument is going to be based on the energy minimum principle. So first, I would like to remind you that uh, the intercentrosomal energy, uh, it, you know, uh, it, it has a shape that's the deepest energy well is uh, at the far end where the uh, repulsive uh, uh, happens, repulsion happens. And uh, so the lowest energy is achieved when the centrosomes are fully separated from each other. And if that's not possible, then the other, you know, slightly shallower energy uh, well is at the attraction end. So uh, the cluster centrosome will be the second best choice. Uh, and the centrosomes really don't want to get stuck in the middle uh, with, uh, you know, a high energy. So now back to the cell. Since the cell volume is fixed, Okay, in that case, and so a round cell would have a larger equatorial plane, and a flat cell would have, oh, sorry, a round cell would have smaller equatorial plane, and a large cell would have a larger, uh, a flat cell would have a larger equatorial plane. So on a smaller equator, what happens is the centrosomes, if they're fully scattered, you can see the distance between them uh, uh, are not, uh, you know, uh, large enough to reach the repulsive energy well. And so the overall free energy is high uh, in this case. So uh, whereas uh, if the, if the cell, uh, centrosomes form uh, two poles, now you know, uh, two of these uh, can uh, sit comfortably uh, you know, in the uh, uh, repulsive energy well, and the other can sit in the next best choice in the attractive energy well. And so uh, overall, uh, you know, in this case, uh, with with a round cell, uh, the multipolar uh, spindle is energetically less favorable than the bipolar, and so the bipolar is the best choice. And the opposite uh, happens uh, with the flat cell. Now the equatorial plane is larger, and so all these centrosomes can sit comfortably, uh, you know, scattered enough um, uh, on that equi uh, enlarged equatorial plane, and so the multipolar spindle. Uh, becomes the energy energetically more favorable uh, configuration. So um, uh, this explains why a flat cell is more prone to multipolar spinal formation. And the same reason about spatial constraints also explains why the spindle tends to form on the equator uh, in the first place, because that's where the most they can most comfortably scatter from each other and achieve the lowest repulsive energy. And the same reason also explains why the smaller cells are better at forming bipolar spindle. Again, because small cells cannot accommodate multipolar uh, spindles, uh, uh, you know, uh, cannot accommodate a fully separated uh, multipolar uh, 
uh, configuration. Um, so uh, due to the time, I'm gonna just quickly go through this. Next, we also look at uh, the effect of outward radial force, uh, which is uh, this part. And we found that although it doesn't affect uh, the uh, uh, rates of bipolar spin spinal formation, it does affect uh, the stability of the bipolar spinal formation. So here you can see that when the outward force is small, um, uh, uh, the spinal tends to be unstable. And so we also have an understanding uh, from the model, but I, I don't have uh, a lot of time to, uh, you know, uh, de uh, discuss in detail, but I'm just quickly going to mention this is because uh, the fluctuations of the centrosomes are rectified. So the fluctuation uh, along the uh, uh, spinal axis is um, inhibited because of the outward force. And that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, that promotes uh, the um, stability of the of the of the centrosomes because when uh, fluctuation is in this uh, direction, uh, uh, centrosomes tend to like change clusters and also you know fall out from the original cluster. And finally, we tested the effect of different number of centrosomes, and we can see uh, that uh, you know the higher the centrosome number is. Uh, the less likely it's going to form a bipolar spindle. Uh, this probably explains why cells with more than four to six centrosomes are very rarely observed. They would easily undergo a multipolar division and die. And the reason more centrosomes are harder to cluster in the model is because uh, there are many more specific configurations that multipolar spindle state uh, can take uh, when the centrosome number is large. So in other words, uh, you know, uh, when centrosome number is large, the entropy associated with multipolar spindle um, is higher. So uh, that would correspond to a lower free energy. Um, so with that, I would like to quickly summarize what I told you. So we have uh, constructed a simplified biophysical model that focuses just on the centrosome dynamics in the mitotic cells um, and using potential energy to characterize the movement. Um, and the model can predict key factors for bipolar spindle formation under different centrosome perturbation. It really explains how a spindle can uh, both cluster and separate uh, centrosomes as, as it needs. And uh, you know, it really uh, brings an insight into spindle formation from an energetic perspective. So the bipolar uh, case uh, is energetically favorite, uh, you know, in a regular case, but if there's some perturbation to the system, this energy uh, profile can tilt and then multipolar or monopolar uh, spindle would be uh, favored uh, in those cases. So with that, I would like to thank the people who did the work. Xiao Chu Li is the graduate student who did all the mathematical modeling and our experimental collaborator is Daniela Shimini from Virginia Tech. Uh, so her graduate student, Matt Bloomfield and undergraduate student, Alexandra Bridgeland uh, did the experiment. And I would like to also quickly uh, do an ad. So we are recruiting uh, postdocs and graduate students. And so we have actually more uh, uh, different topics. What I uh, talked about today is just you know one part of what we're doing so with that i would like to thank you and uh, take questions <laughs>